Before we get into the conditions that the refugees are facing uh, in Nauru, what kind of access did Amnesty International get to the detention center? Because as we know it, uh, they've made it very difficult for foreign journalists uh, to gain any access to talk to the refugees. Uh, what was your experience? Well, I think the wall of secrecy around what's happening on Nauru is particularly concerning. We tried six times, we wrote to the government of Nauru to say, can we come and, and make an official visit? And twice they responded and said no, and four other times they didn't even get back to us. So ultimately we decided to go in there. We went in there legally, but we didn't uh, inform the government of, of what we were doing. Um, and we were able to spend a total of 12 days there talking to the, the refugees and asylum seekers in the community. But unfortunately, we weren't able to, to go inside the detention centre itself. We could only see the conditions they were living in in uh, the community. Just to be clear, were, were you able to physically go as well? Were you among the group? No, we had a senior researcher from our London office and a senior researcher from Human Rights Watch. I was there in 2012, at the end of 2012, but we haven't been allowed to get back since then. What did your colleagues learn during those 12 days? What did the refugees tell them about the way that they're treated, any medical care that they get or don't get, food, conditions, treatment? Well, I think our researchers were absolutely shocked. And these are seasoned researchers. They've been to war zones. They've been to places like Syria and Russia and, and dealt with secrecy and, and governments that are trying to, to make life difficult. And, and they were actually uh, appalled at what they saw, that, that this was a first world government inflicting this type of conditions on people seeking protection even small children who were, were trying to self-harm, who were trying to suicide because of the despair they were suffering, lack of medical treatment for people with serious heart conditions, kidney conditions, almost daily abuse that they're getting, um, physical threats, sexual uh, threats, uh, sexual assault, um, people who'd reported uh, attempted rapes to us. Uh, you know, it just went on and on and on and nearly everyone we spoke to talked about some level of mental health problem, let alone physical problems being caused by being on such a dry, dusty, remote, hot island. Uh, it was quite shocking and, and this is something that's been happening for three years for those people. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. Uh, way too long, especially for those who are going through that kind of suffering. Uh, again, no response from the Australian government regarding this Amnesty International report, but the these kind of allegations are not new. We've been hearing about them for quite some time now, about the way the refugees are allegedly being treated. How do you expect the government to respond and how has the Australian government responded in the past to such allegations? Well, unfortunately, with the, the wall of secrecy, um, they're able to just deny everything. And when we say, well, let people, let journalists go in to see for themselves, uh, then nobody's allowed in. Unfortunately, the Australian government has said these people will never be brought to Australia. Uh, they have to remain on that island. But it's just simply not sustainable. And we can see that it's not sustainable. It's damaging people. So, you know, we're again calling on the government to, to bring them back to Australia. However, we, we have to wait and see. We've just had a recent election here in Australia. Mm -hmm. We're hoping that can lead to some changes in policy. We know that PNG, the Manus Island uh, centre where other asylum seekers have been taken to, that's unravelling because of court challenges in the PNG Supreme Court. So this, this policy is just not sustainable mm -hmm. at all. So it's time for the government yeah. to actually reconsider it.